In the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country on which we reside on today. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers today. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Laura and I'm the Senior Communications Manager here at PCFA. It is my great honour to introduce Professor Philip Stricker for today's webcast. Many of you may know of Phil's work, which has earned him acclaim at home and abroad. His expertise is in high demand, and he is one of Australia's leading contributors to a growing body of worldwide evidence on minimally invasive prostate cancer treatments. Today, Phil will be presenting on the topic of focal therapy. Without any further ado, I'll now hand over to Phil to get the conversation started. Thanks, Laura, um, for uh, honouring me and asking me to uh, give this presentation. It's been an interesting 11-year uh, uh, journey so far and uh, about 600 patients down the track. And um, I, I have to uh, mention how honoured I am to come back to PCFA uh, because... Uh, PCFA was very close to my heart and I was uh, basically one of the key players that actually created its formation many, many years ago. So it's lovely to come back and talk about something which is um, protecting the quality of life of some of our patients with prostate cancer. Again, thanks for inviting me and I'll, I'm just going to run through uh, a little bit of a background of focal therapy and then I'm going to run through a... Uh, our results and um, how we use this focal therapy and tailor it to different people. J just a little bit of background that, um, you know, what are the treatments for localised prostate cancer these days? And, and as you can appreciate, there's obviously surgery in all of its different forms, including robotics, uh, brachytherapy, radiotherapy, and even that's improved enormously. Uh, high dose brachytherapy, active surveillance, but now focal therapy is becoming um, more established. With every person that comes up with a cancer, there are many factors to consider when tailoring treatment to that patient. And obviously tumor factors are important. Prostate factors such as size of prostate and urinary symptoms are important. Local factors such as um, pathology in the pelvis, such as fractured pelvis or uh, different disease states such as ulcerative colitis might affect it. Patient factors probably are the most important. And patient, by, what I mean by this is uh, every patient has different priorities in their life. And um, not only might they value sexual function or their situation may be in, uh, you know, impacted and they may have certain priorities, you know, they may have an enormous fear of incontinence, uh, but every patient has their own priorities. And then, of course, there's institutional factors such as local expertise. One institution might be better at surgery than radiotherapy, another may be the opposite. We all know that um, it's a multidisciplinary care in prostate cancer and uh, having a medical oncologist and radiation oncologist involved, uh, having patients with their wives, discussing with prostate cancer nurses, something the PCFA has done brilliantly, uh, discussing with sexual health physicians, uh, all very important. And this can individualise or help us individualise treatment. But when a doctor is talking to a patient, uh, they may be thinking of different things. Um, one, you know, the patient may be thinking of continence or urinary control uh, or sexual uh, function. And the priorities that the patient and the doctor put on these is often different. It's important to realize that patients are fully prepared to trade quality of life for length of life. And this is a study that we did with uh, the Cancer Council of New South Wales uh, over a decade ago. And here you can see that uh, 
if a patient knew that they were going to have severe urinary incontinence, they would be prepared to trade 27 months of life expectancy to avoid that. And, you know, different patients have different priorities, and it's important that this is discussed with the patient. It's the patient's decision. And then, of course, there's different types of patients. Every person that walks into my office is a different type of person. Some of them are the, I quote, I want it out type. And some of them are, you're not taking, I'm never going to surgery type. But then, of course, there's the, um, the patient who comes in who has a stack of information and they want to be part of the decision process. And then there are other patients who want to rather um, the doctor take, understand their situation and give them a recommendation. And everybody's different. Active surveillance, as you know, is one option in prostate cancer. And whilst it has been popular for Gleason 6 tumours, increasingly it's becoming popular for some good Gleason 7 tumours. And what we do in this group of people is we monitor them. And recent data has shown that even after 20 years, it seems to be safe. Robot radical prostatectomy uh, then came in about 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, is it really better? Well, um, we published um, after many, many cases of uh, robot radical prostatectomies, and it is now the gold standard. In fact, it's the gold standard over open surgery, although um, obviously a very good open surgeon still gives excellent results. But these days, all the young budding urologists are coming up and they're, they're training extremely well doing robotic cases. And um, it's now been shown beyond much doubt that uh, it's a quicker recovery and probably gives better results, particularly in difficult cases. But there's a learning curve. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be the first person on the learning curve. And it's critical to understand that when you're doing this type of surgery, that you know, you're really trying to get rid of the cancer, but at the same time, protect the nerves. And obviously there's only millimeters of margin of safety there. Uh, this was a diagram that it, it's not all or nothing. You don't just spare the nerve or you don't spare the nerves in surgery. And so with surgery, um, you know, if you go out and take all the nerve out, you don't get any potency. Whereas if you really protect the nerves, you can get up to 95% potency recovery. And always remember that the, the surgeon is the most critical key in surgery. Radiotherapy is also improving. And uh, whilst this is the standard radiotherapy machine and they can really increase the dose to certain areas, there are new machinery out, uh, such as the MR Linac machine, where radiotherapy is done inside an MRI machine. We had the first one here at St. Vincent's some time ago, about four years ago, and we've now done over 400 cases. And in five treatments over 10 days, this can now be completed. So everything's moving to improve the quality of life of patients. So why then does focal therapy emerge? Well, the reason why focal therapy emerges is because the imaging with MRI and PET scan and better biopsies have made us able to get more detail of the cancer. And if it's just localized to one tiny area, then that may be suitable just to treat that one area, similar to breast cancer, where lumpectomy, for example, is being used, or similar to kidney cancer, where you take only part of the kidney out. The other reason why it's become popular is because we've realized from some of the big studies, and you're not expected to know these studies, but they were called the Protect, Pivot, and SPCG4 study. It was shown that um, we're over-treating prostate cancer. Some people with a Gleason 7 tumor will never die of their cancer. So why make them incontinent or give them radiation side effects if we can give them something less invasive? 
And then another piece of information came out showing that most cancers which spread to other parts of the body from prostate cancer come from one little area. So if we could get rid of that one little area, then that may protect you as well as surgery or radiotherapy. And then, of course, finally, the critical factor is patient preference. Patients don't want their prostate removed. Patients don't want radiotherapy and the potential side effects. So if they can have a day procedure and have their, treat, their cancer treated, even with monitoring, they may be happier. It's also important to realize that radiotherapy, even with all the new, uh, sorry, surgery, even with all the new treatments uh, over the years from 2008 to 2015, things haven't improved that much. There's still a lot of erection problems that occur with surgery. And, uh, and this, I could do the same line with radiotherapy. You know, the side effects of radiotherapy have not really improved that much, even with the improvement in radiotherapy techniques. They have for the bowel, but not for the urinary tract. So surgery and radiotherapy cause significant side effects. So with focal therapy, the aim of course, is you find a little cancer such as this, and then you destroy that cancer by uh, either heat, freezing, or electricity, or any other ablation technique with a good safety margin. And of course, given the improvements with MRI and PSMA PET scanning, you can see these very clearly, and you can monitor them after the treatment very clearly. The big advantage, of course, with focal therapy is that there's way less side effects, and we'll talk about that. Now, focal therapy isn't just one spot. Sometimes there's two spots next to each other. Sometimes there's two spots not quite next to each other. Sometimes they're at the front. So, but what it is, it's treating only part of the prostate to try and minimize the side effects. And the energies that we use uh, besides what I'm gonna talk about, which is the nano knife, uh, high intensity focused ultrasound, cryotherapy, brachytherapy, and laser therapy. In Australia, uh, the, the current ones which are uh, available are NanoKnife, which is IRE, irreversible electroporation, brachytherapy, which is uh, radioactive seeds, and laser therapy. HIFU is still available in Australia, but it's becoming less popular. Now, if we look at the current treatment, if you've got a low risk cancer, we treat it with, of course, active surveillance. If you've got an intermediate high risk cancer, we treat it with whole gland therapy such as surgery, brachytherapy or radiotherapy. Now, isn't it, wouldn't it be nice if the low risk ones were treated with active surveillance, the high risk ones were treated with whole gland therapy and the intermediate risk ones, which constitute a large group of people were treated with vocal therapy and without all the side effects of surgery and radiotherapy. So if we look at the side effects of surgery, radiotherapy and vocal therapy and compare them, urinary issues, obviously surgery and radiotherapy have quite a lot of urinary issues, uh, but focal therapy has minimal. Incontinence, Surgery, of course, has the highest chance of incontinence. Even radiotherapy has some, but focal therapy almost has none. Impotence. The chance of impotence is quite high with surgery or radiotherapy. It's very low with focal therapy. And then, of course, the bowel damage is much more common with radiotherapy, but very rare with focal therapy. And the chance of follow-up treatment after focal therapy isn't that different from the follow-up therapy that may be needed after surgery or radiotherapy. So that's why focal therapy is becoming a more popular option in selected patients. This is a picture which shows that the cancers that are in the prostate, just over here, 
this little group here are the group that actually spread to the rest of the body. If you could get rid of that group of aggressive cells which could move, that may be all you need to do rather than treating the whole prostate. And this was called the index lesion. I suppose the next question is, how quickly is this being taken up throughout the world? This is what's called the heat registry of high foo focal therapy in England. And as you can see, there are big numbers of people now choosing focal therapy in England. Indeed, in England, high foo is the most popular, but irreversible electroporation or nano knife, as well as cryotherapy, are also now approved therapies on, available on the NHS. So who's the right person for focal therapy? And I apologize for this slide because it's pretty busy, but I'll, only about 20% of people who come in with a new cancer are suitable for focal therapy. And there's no point treating focal therapy if it's all over the place, then you need whole gland therapy such as surgery or radiotherapy. But the ideal group are not the people who are suitable for active surveillance. So not Gleason 6 tumors. The ideal group are the people who have got a Gleason 7 tumor. And in this group, particularly in an older age group, it helps avoid over-treatment and excess side effects. It should be, of course, focal. It should be thoroughly evaluated by a biopsy, transperineally, and high-quality imaging. And that imaging is going to be MRI or PSMA or both. The biopsy should line up perfectly with the imaging, and they must accept follow-up intensive monitoring to make sure that all the tumor is gone. Obviously, the patient must have a high desire to preserve genitourinary function and must accept and be aware of the uncertainties of the long-term results of focal therapies and how salvage therapy can come in. Now, the reason why I've gone with NanoKnife as an energy source is because it's reliable. It doesn't rely on heat or freezing, so therefore it works irrespective of the nature of the tissue. It's very easy to broaden the field, and it's been shown that it's very important to widen the field to kill a safety margin around the tumour. There's less collateral damage, even with wider treatment within a, it's well within our skill set as urologists so it's not hard to do these things take me about 45 to 60 minutes to do there's no need for complex and expensive inboard treatments inside an MRI machine it's suitable for all parts of the prostate and it doesn't burn your bridges you can still have surgery or radiotherapy if it doesn't work it's got min minimal limitations. You can do it in the front of the prostate, the apex, the posterior. If it's calcified or there's pieces of metal in the prostate, it has no effect on the electricity or the irreversible electroporation. You can even put the urethra in the middle of the field and the urethra will still survive. And uh, even if the cancer is a little bit outside of the shell of the prostate, you can still do irreversible electroporation. The great advantage of this is that it seems to allow, because it's not thermal, greater recovery of erections. So to summarize then, the reason why um, I went with the nano knife treatment or what's called irreversible electroporation, it's reliable, it's a quick day surgery procedure, it's repeatable, it's got the potential to preserve structures and salvage radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy are still possible. So this is how it's set up. The patient's anaesthetized. We have an ultrasound machine and we put little needles into the prostate to ablate the prostate, 45 to 60 minutes. This is the nano knife machine. It's just got little electrodes that go in. And this is... For example, a little spot in the prostate, which is a cancer. And so if we were to treat that, what we would do, there's the cancer, 
we put one electrode here, one there, one there, one there, and then we'd start putting electricity while the person's asleep between each pair. So first between that pair, then that pair, then that pair, then that pair, then the cross hatches. And then once you've done all that and you do an MRI a week later, you'll see that all that area is dead. And so the cancer with a safety margin is treated. The monitoring afterwards is fairly simple. It's every three months for the first year. An MRI is done at six months. And in one year, we strongly recommend a biopsy to make sure that the cancer is gone. How does it work? We pass the electricity across a cell and it puts little holes in that membrane of the cell from which it cannot recover. And the beauty of it is it makes no difference what the nature of the tissue is. This will work and get rid of all cells. But the great advantage, and this is an electron micrograph showing the little holes in the cells that it creates. The great advantage of IRE or electricity or irreversible electroporation is whilst it kills all the cells, all the structures like uh, blood vessels and urethras do not get destroyed. Their cells die, but then they recover and the structures continue. So if you've got, for example, a tube going through the middle of the uh, prostate, such as the urethra, you can put the tube there and the tube will remain intact. Whereas with heat and freezing uh, treatments, it destroys them. One of the other advantages of Nanonife is that Wilhelmine van den Bos, uh, eight years ago, did a study of 16 people from the Netherlands where she did nanonife treatment to them. And then one month later, they had their prostate removed. And she found that there was no surviving cells within the nanonife area. And this is very different to some of the heat and freezing treatments, which have never been proven to be as reliable as this. And if you compare it to other forms of treatment, such as HIFU, focal laser, cryoablation, focal brachytherapy, they're all reasonable treatments. And this is a review of all of these treatments, but each one has their advantages. Um, the advantage of uh, irreversible electroporation has got a very low in-field recurrence. So it seems to be reliable in killing the cancer, whereas some of the other energy sources are not quite as reliable because things like the nature of the tissue can have an effect. But I think it's probably quite important to say that any focal therapy has benefits and advantages. And the reason why I've gone with irreversible electroporation is because it has some benefits, but a well-performed focal therapy of any type um, is fine as long as they know what the limitations are of it. I do have some concerns about the other energy sources, however. HIFU, which has become less popular in Australia, um, has a high failure rate within the area of treatment. And it also is affected by the size of the prostate, calcification in the prostate, and you can't do certain parts of the prostate. Similarly, with laser, the extreme apex is difficult and it's quite hard to broaden the field and generally you have to do it inside an MRI machine. But laser is, um, it, it's in its early phase and it's also um, a heat treatment. Cryotherapy is not popular in Australia, it's popular in other areas of the world. Brachytherapy um, has been resurrected a little bit. Uh, the problem with brachytherapy is that it's not repeatable and we, at this stage, don't know what the radiation effect is on the untreated zone. TUCAD was something that came and went. It was just too complex. So how did I introduce this? 2013, I worked with uh, my colleagues in England, and we showed that in the 20 patients we did and the 20 patients they did, that it was safe. The next step was we did many hundreds of cases, 
and we followed them up in a very tightly followed up uh, group and we published our results and we showed that uh, the results gave a very good and safe treatment and um, based on the biopsies at one year, we were able to achieve a high chance of clearing the tumour. I then started training units around Australia. Uh, I trained John Yaxley's group in Brisbane and Nathan Lorencheck's group in Epworth and more recently, Mark Frydenberg's group in Monash. And so we're now duplicating the results. And in fact, John Yaxley recently published his data and showed that the, the results were exactly the same as ours. And our first publication uh, showed that we were able to get clearance of the cancer in 97.3% of patients. So only 2.7% of patients recurred within the area where we treated. The problem that we had, however, was over a five-year follow-up, cancers were recurring in the normal residual part of the prostate. So obviously, um, there is a tendency, as with breast cancer, if you do a lumpectomy, that the rest of the or breast or prostate have a chance of cancer there. And we have to get this down. And um, we have some theories as to how we might do that. This is just uh, another advantage of Nanonuf. We showed that at the extreme apex of the prostate, and we did 50 patients at the extreme apex, that we were able to clear 97.5% of those. And even though it was right near the sphincter, uh, by 12 months, we only had a 2% incontinence rate, and that had dropped down to zero at 24 months. So. With some of the other energy sources with the apex, it's much more difficult to reliably treat this area. And of course, the potential for nerve recovery, uh, recently a randomized trial of focal versus extended nano knife therapy showed that the early difference between a focal therapy and extended therapy in terms of sexual uh, issues, there was quite a significant difference between the erections at six months. But after six months, there was very little difference, suggesting that with time, erections recovered after nanonife therapy. And then we published our big group of people. Uh, we've treated 530 patients now uh, over a 10 year period. And uh, we looked at 244 who had got um, um, a minimum of two year follow up and who had not been treated after previous radiotherapy. And what we found was this that at five years, 85% of patients had not had any further treatment. And if you project out to 10 years, we've got about 70% of people with no further treatment. So, and if you look at the treatments that people had, if the nano knife fails, such as radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy, these treatments were still options, even though the nano knife had failed in that 17% of people. Then if we ask, well, the reason why people are having focal therapy, of course, is to reduce the side effect profile. Well, if you look at the incontinence rate of people uh, after nano knife treatment, the incontinence rate before treatment was 2% and after treatment, 2.3%. No different. Uh, there was a 10% drop in potency, and uh, this drop in potency is definitely a complication but this is much less than the side effects of uh, surgery or radiotherapy. What was really encouraging was there were no major complications from the treatment itself. And then John Yaxley published his data from 70 patients, 23 month follow-up. And you can see the, the cancer clearance was similar to ours. The good erections were similar to ours and the urinary control was similar to ours. So 
it seems to be able to be taught and duplicated. And this uh, we're doing at the moment in America as well. One of the big problems, of course, is let's say it fails. Have we burnt our bridges for surgery? Well, this is 22 patients where we removed the prostate after we felt nanonife had failed. And if I could draw your attention to um, the positive margin rate, in the 22 patients, only two of them had a positive margin and both were low grade Gleason 6. And 100% of them had were retained their continence. So these people did pretty well. Now, 61% potency is not quite as good as uh, the potency we would get up front. Uh, so probably the compromise with this salvage surgery is not in terms of cancer clearance and not in terms of continence, but in terms of potency. The other question that I'm often asked is, is IRE repeatable? And the answer is, yes, it is. But only about 60% of people are successfully retreated. But that does decrease the number of people needing surgery. So let's say you had a treatment and three years later it comes back again. In that situation, the um, you can have a repeat nanonife treatment and um, that may avoid you having surgery or radiotherapy. The other group of people that we've treated with nanonife therapy is in the salvage setting. What does that mean? Well, that means you've had previous radiotherapy and you now are looking for another treatment option instead of um, hormone therapy or removal of the prostate. Obviously, you could remove the prostate after radiotherapy, but the side effect profile is very high. And you could do high food, brachytherapy, cryotherapy, or even do radiotherapy again, or you could do nanonife therapy. And so we looked at 100 patients who had failed radiotherapy and we treated them with nanonife therapy. And this is the publication we did last year in that. And here's the results. So in those patients at five years, 60% of them appear to have cleared the cancer out of their prostate. Now, that's not 100%, but it's got much lower side effects in the post-radiation setting than salvage surgery. So this is a, a, a new option for patients who fail radiotherapy. In that group of people, the one thing we need to remember is that about 10% of people need further uh, like the surgery to get rid of dead tissue after this treatment. This, of course, is in the post-radiation setting, which, of course, is a much higher risk setting. Uh, there was also further erection problems in this group of people. But on a positive note, even at post-radiation, 93% of people preserve their continence. This is just a comparison of all the different treatment options of uh, um, post-radiation treatments. And if you look at the five-year outcomes, it's very similar whether you have surgery, cryotherapy, HIFU, nanonife, high-dose rate brachytherapy, brachytherapy, they're all very, very similar in terms of curing them between 50 and 60%. Um, however, they're very different in terms of the side effects in genitourinary side effects and gastrointestinal side effects. We like the nanonife here as it seems to have a low side effect profile. So what's the future of nanonife then? I think the future is that it's becoming more widely accepted. Um, we're gonna have better patient selection maybe by using PET scans to assess patients more accurately. We've recently just submitted for publication a finding that the nanonife seems to improve immunity against cancer of the prostate. We've set up a multi-center registry. Uh, we're uh, conducting randomized controlled trials in Sweden. And there's a big FDA preserved trial, which is about to publish its results in America. In July last year, the 
National Institute of Clinical Excellence said that IRE or Nanonife is no longer experimental. This is a picture of the effect that Nanonife can have on the cell population inside the prostate. And we've now proven that um, Nanonife actually creates an immune effect and it could be possible to add an immune therapy to the nanonife and maybe even help regress tumors which have spread. But this at this stage is experimental, where we have multi-center registries uh, across Australia, already the Wesley, Cabrini, Tel Aviv, Netherlands, and many other centers have agreed to submit their nanonife patients to the registry. This is just a publication we recently put in showing that the PSMA PET scan may improve patient selection. Just to explain to you, for example, if, um, uh, if we think that the cancer is over here on the left-hand side and the PSMA says, hey guys, you've missed something over here, that may avoid us doing nanonife treatment or focal therapy when we shouldn't. And so we're hoping that this might get our recurrence rate in the outfield down from 12% down to 6%, but that remains to be proven. The PRESERVE trial is a trial in the United States that's fully accrued, and they'll be publishing the results of their 123 patients throughout America in the next two months of the nanonar. And so uh, obviously if it's a positive result, and I have good reason to believe it will be, then this will become a popular option in the United States. And then there's a randomized trial occurring in Sweden that I'm helping supervise uh, under Anna Lance, where they're comparing surgery to focal therapy. So how does IRE compare? The intermediate term data up to 10 years is now present and available. It's safe and easily integrated. It's got minimal collateral damage. The oncological results, the cancer results are at least equal to other technologies. The functional results are equal or in fact superior to other technologies. It's repeatable, it's applicable to all areas of the prostate and it's suitable for primary and salvage cases. Big question is when will it be reimbursed? At the moment it's expensive and there are no clinical trials. Uh, we are about to submit an MSAC application in April of this year and we would hope that we would have an item number within two years of that. Uh, currently, no focal therapy is reimbursed in Australia. We're doing a multi-site registry at the Garvin, and um, at the moment, there is 10-year data available. In England, it's approved through the NHS. The FDA preserved trial is now completed, and hopefully that will start uh, reimbursement in America, and there are now multiple centres trained throughout Australia. So in conclusion, uh, focal therapy with nanonife in the primary or post-radiation setting is suitable for men with a unilateral localized intermediate risk prostate cancer. Strict follow-up is essential. Nanonife or IRE provides reliable infield ablation with acceptable medium-term and even intermediately long-term results with good oncological and functional outcomes. Uh, we need better patient selection and maybe PSMA may help then. I didn't go into epigenetics because that's a little bit too, more, too experimental. And long-term registries are essentials and are underway. So in summary then, focal therapy is not the future, it's the present. Focal region or segment, up to 25 to 50% of prostate can be treated. Follow-up has to be very diligent and Focal irreversible electroporation is my choice, but I can see no reason why a well-performed uh, laser treatment or a well-performed brachytherapy wouldn't also be appropriate. So thanks for your attention. And just to finish off with a challenging slide, and as you can see, due to technological advances, everything I've taught you about computers is no longer valid. And of course, this is what's happened with all these things. Uh, focal therapy is now here. It, uh, it's not making other things invalid. It's just adding another treatment option.
That was absolutely wonderful, Phil. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I have to say this topic has been extremely popular with the prostate cancer community here in Australia. Uh, when we did put a call out to the community for questions, we received many. So to attempt to get through some of these questions, uh, and I do think you have um, at least partially answered actually during the presentation, some of the questions that our community have had. Um, but look, we'll dive in. Um, so we put a call out to our support groups and also to the wider prostate cancer community. Uh, we did receive a lot of questions and we will do our best to get through them. We will start off with a question regarding um, given the limitation on MP MRI resolution of very small tumours, and given the potentially metastatic nature of some prostate cancer micro tumours, how can focal therapy alone provide any confidence of a cure? So, so it, it's an outstanding question because, re really, um, below the five millimeter size, you can't really see tumors in the prostate. But on the very positive side, um, unless you've got a Gleason 9 or 10 tumor, which is not our area that we're focusing on, we're focusing on the ones which grow to quite a large size, the Gleason 7 tumors, where they're still curable and they haven't spread. So if we focus on that group of people and we treat those with focal therapy, then we will minimize the side effect profile and they're not the ones that have spread early and they're the ones that can grow to a reasonable size so we can detect them. So I think that it's horses for courses. Uh, I agree that this doesn't solve the problem of high grade cancers, Gleason 9 and 10. These, these ones spread very early and very quickly and they need more systemic therapy. But what we're addressing is the group in the middle, the intermediate risk prostate cancers. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Phil. Okay, so I'll jump to our next question here, which is, are there any clinical trials where focal therapies have been combined with limited duration hormone therapy to improve the chances of a favorable outcome? Um, again, um, not only hormone therapy, but immunotherapy and chemotherapy have been combined with focal therapy programs. Um, there hasn't been one in a formal clinical trial yet. And the reason for that is focal therapy is in its infancy still. And, and until focal therapy can be proven to be safe and can be proven to work uh, in intermediate term follow-up, it's unwise to start adding it to other things as well. So that's the next stage. And uh, at St. Vincent's, I'm going to be adding a immunotherapy uh, to the nano knife as something to tr try and combine it. Um, but all these things, you have to walk before you run. So you need to prove that focal therapy is safe first, and then you uh, start adding in other things in clinical trials. But yes, that's certainly on the radar. For example, in New York at the moment, they're doing a trial of combining radiotherapy with nanonite therapy. And so as with breast cancer, as you can imagine with breast cancer, when lumpectomy came in, they were worried about the outfield. And so that by having radiotherapy to the outfield, that may minimize the chance of an outfield failure. Um, I wasn't comfortable with joining that trial, so I didn't join that trial. Uh, for many, many reasons. But, but, but yes, people are thinking about this all the time. And, um, uh, and I think hormone therapy is probably not going to be the thing they combine with it. I think it's going to be more immunotherapy or radiotherapy. Very well put. Thank you. Our next questionnaire has asked, how many focal therapies or interventions can you have? Most people will say two. Um, th there is no question I've treated uh, one or two patients at their absolutely very strong request four times. Um, but I, you know, I think if you give it two shots and it hasn't worked, then I think you're better to go for a more conservative management. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the next question is, can you mix and match focal therapies? 
I was recently a guest speaker in Chicago at the focal therapy meeting, and uh, this discussion came up frequently that, um, you know, for this particular tumor, you use HIFU, for this particular tumor, you use NanoKnife, for this particular tumor, you use laser. Um, I'm not a believer of that. Uh, I'm a believer that you have to be good at one focal therapy. You have to do it really well. And you have to have a technology which can be applicable to all prostate segments, which I think NanoKnife is. Having said that, if somebody is going down another pathway, then as long as they do it well and they do it diligently and they follow up, follow up carefully and then they work out what areas the prostate don't work with that, then they can add it another one. I haven't found that necessary with the nano knife. Fantastic. Our next question is looking ahead at the future of focal therapies. And we'd love to get your perspective on if you see any new methods of focal therapy coming out in the next sort of five to 10 years. I, I think that focal therapy, um, there will be better selection of patients for focal therapy and there will be better targeting of the treatment with focal therapy. And so the selection, I um, mean, one of the big problems is with prostate cancer, we believe that the whole prostate has a tendency to form cancers. And so just treating one area is not ideal. Um, I mean, sure, if we select the right patient, 83% of them do well long-term, but it's not 100%. So to approach 100%, we have to have a pretty good idea of the rest of the prostate. And we have to know whether the rest of the prostate is going to develop other cancers. And so there are, there's a science called epigenetics, which is looking at that with a thing called uh, GST pi. And they, uh, they do analysis of that and they can tell you whether in the next five years something's going to pop up there before you can see it. And so if we can predict that, I think that's going to be part of the future of focal therapy, being able to predict it. And then how can we more accurately target it? Well, I think with, um, you know, we wouldn't drive up to Byron Bay without having a, uh, uh, you know, our Google Maps and everything. And I think the Google maps in the prostate are going to become much more accurate and we're going to be able to really target in there with uh, technology exactly where the tumour is with a safety margin. And I think that type of accuracy will improve as well. Fantastic. The next question refers to radical prostatectomies um, and is... Are there any new treatments, uh, specifically, of course, referring to focal therapy here, that might be able to compensate the negations caused by radical prostate removals? So I think what you're saying is, um, um, you know, radical prostatectomy is still the gold standard. And, and so wouldn't it be nice if nobody became incontinent or impotent? I think that's what you're saying. Yes. And, um, I think we now have some people in the world like Viv Patel who've done 14,000 of these and tried to perfect the technique and he's certainly improved it, but he still can't get quite down to the no incontinence and no impotence stage. So I, I think it's plateaued radical prostatectomy. I think we don't totally understand the cause of impotence. Some of it's vascular, some of it's neurological. We don't completely understand the cause of incontinence. And so until we totally understand it, we won't. Having said that, I recently listened to an amazing discussion over in America by Manny Menon. Now, this will be interesting to some people. And he described a new surgical technique where you leave some of the prostate behind, but you protect the sphincter and you protect the nerves but you leave some of the prostate behind. So it's almost like a surgical focal therapy. And so he showed unbelievably good results, but he's leaving some prostate behind. So we've got the same issues again. So is that the future? I don't think it is, but it was an interesting presentation. Absolutely, yes. Um, our next question is a little bit left of field and it's going more towards the holistic sort of treatment view of prostate cancer. 
The next questionnaire is asking, uh, in your opinion, what is the relationship between the prostate and diet and supplementation? Well, well I think there's been a lot of uh, data over the last 30 to 40 years looking at diet and supplementation. And uh, probably the strongest data comes out of Japan where um, traditional Japanese families, particularly in places like Okinawa, have shown that um, the incidence of cancer in those traditional communities was ridiculously low. And people speculate as to why that was the case, but when they emigrate to different parts of the world, within one generation, they end up with the same incidence of cancer as our Western society has. And people speculate it's due to uh, obesity, eating too much. It's uh, to do with refined sugars. It's to do with saturated fats. It's possibly to do with supplements, you know, deficiency in selenium, lycopenes. Uh, but I personally think that um, one of the big, big factors, and I think there's three of them, which seem to be the big factors, not so much supplements, but I think the big factors are one, obesity. I think we eat too much as a Western society. And one of the things that they do in Okinawa is that they always leave some food on the plate. They never complete their meal. The second thing is refined sugars. We need to stop eating so much refined sugars. And the third thing is too much saturated fat. They're the big ones. Now, the small items such as all the supplements and things, I think there's sugar on the top. I don't think they're the main uh, story. Yep. Absolutely. Very well put. Thank you. Um, we've just got one more question left, which is uh, do it yourself or at home PSA testing kits going to become available in the future? I think that doing things at home, you know, with an Apple Watch, monitoring your pulse, monitoring your general health is going to become more and more popular. But I think the critical factor is interpreting these results. And, and so you can have all the results you want and we, we will have them. But just as with PSA came in, when it first came in, we thought it would detect cancer of the prostate. It doesn't. It just detects something is wrong with the prostate. And then you require somebody to be able to actually interpret, is it benign enlargement? Is it prostatitis? Is it prostate cancer? And then within prostate cancer, is it a significant cancer, insignificant? Does it need immediate treatment? And so all of the follow-on stuff becomes more important than just having the test. Sure, it's nice to monitor things and see what the fluctuations are. And I think that as long as it's interpreted well and doesn't create a neurotic society will be a good thing. And so it's different for different people. If I was talking to a person who has an anxiety state, I would say that's the worst thing you could do for that person. Whereas if I'm talking to a person who just wants to know everything about themselves and is a meticulous physics professor, then I think that's perfect. So different for different strokes. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a brilliant discussion and we're incredibly grateful to you all for tuning in today. If you do have any questions about any of the topics that have been discussed, please get in touch with PCFA. Uh, you can call us on 1800 220099 or you can send us an email at telenurse at pcfa.org.au. Thank you so much, Phil, for joining us today. And remember that number, it is 1800 220099 for more information and advice. We'll see you in the next webinar.